So today, uh, Peter Messenger, he's the uh, Deputy Commandant for Operations, which means he's responsible for establishing and providing operational strategy, policy guidance, and resources as needed for Coast Guard missions and as the, you know, taking care of our, our um, safety, security, and stewardship on the ocean. That means that, of course, he's had an incredibly diverse career uh, within the Coast Guard and because a lot of us who spend a lot of our time on, on and below and the ocean waters get accused of sort of being arrested adolescents for lacking gravitas. So to overcompensate, he's gotten three master's degrees. And, um, and, and as I say, is, is representing uh, the front line. And, you know, we talk about the reforms we want. Somebody has to enforce them. And uh, today, that's, that's the U.S. Coast Guard. So I'd like to welcome that more. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, David. Thanks for, for being here. You know, it's great. I think about half of the audience came up here as sponsors, so that's a pretty good sign for people who care about the oceans. And uh, and, and David's right that uh, you know we do we do really care about the oceans. I certainly do. I, I grew up uh, I was talking to uh, Eric Bergman, who's going to follow me, and I was saying that I grew up on Lake Erie which may not sound like an ocean, but it sort of connects you to water, and I've always had a real affinity for the water and the all things wet, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, you know, I saw in the program that the title of this is uh, From Sandy to the Arctic, and I was trying to think, well, how in the world do I tie those two together, Hurricane Sandy and the Arctic? And I, and I think I tied them together in the way that David just suggested. I, I tied them together with the United States Coast Guard. This is a, a group that I've been part of for a long time, and... Uh, and, and I really enjoy the work that we do because it really puts us squarely between the politics and policies required uh, for ocean conservancy, ocean stewardship that um, Senator Whitehouse was, was referring to and was, was uh, making mention of, and the exploration and discovery and the research necessary to inform those policies and politics. But between that lies the day-to-day -day operations uh, on the oceans. And the oceans, as you know, are a pretty busy place. There's, it's, it's busy for the citizens of the ocean, the fish and the mammals and all the, all the characters that are swimming around underneath the water uh, and those uh, mechanical characters that swim around underneath the water. Uh, but it's also busy on top of the oceans too because they're, they're a place of, uh, of great economic value and great economic resource and they're a real conveyor belt for world trade and the like. So if you think about the fundamental mission of the U.S. Coast Guard, and, and David just mentioned it, it's the safety, the security, and the stewardship of our nation's waters and, and those waters that our nation cares about, whether it's our exclusive economic zones or the, um, or the open waters that, that we have treaties to protect fisheries and, and the like. Uh, what does that mean? The safety part's fairly straightforward. Most people think search and rescue. I mean, think about the, 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 the pulling people out of distress, but it also includes the management of the vessels to ensure that those, the, the ships that are sailing on those waters do so in a manner consistent with what we think of as protection of the waters. So that they have the proper equipment on board to prevent pollution at sea. They have the proper equipment on board to pre prevent people from losing their lives at sea. Uh, are they operated by people who know what they're doing? So we license those people as well. The security piece, uh, most people think post 9-11 when they think security, and there certainly is that aspect of protecting us from people who might want to do bad things to us. But it also includes recovery from disaster and resilience to protect us against the next disaster. So when you look at things like Hurricane Sandy, and I know there's a panel coming up which is going to dig deeper into disaster response, but, but if you just think about, you know, what does it take to be resilient to disasters when they happen? And disasters will always happen. Stewardship is a little bit more, more of one of those inside the beltway wonky, wonky kind of words, but what it really means to me is environmental protection of the oceans, protecting them from all of that activity, to the extent you can. I mean, there's a certain trade-off associated with allowing activity to occur on the oceans, but it's also managing it properly, so that, so that not just protecting it, but managing it so that, so that you can move safely uh, around the water. So it's all of the traffic schemes. It's the work with our international partners to, to determine what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. But I think of stewardship in a very broad way. And we do that, you always try to prevent things from happening if you can, uh, but you've got to be ready to respond to them when they do. So, as I said before, uh, the world, the oceans really do contain some important resources. Humans being what they are, they're going to find a way to, to, to take advantage of those resources, right? I mean, I, so my world is a very practical world, it's not very abstract, it just says, alright, 
despite what we might want to do to, to, to make things as safe and as, and as protected as possible, we know that humans being who they are uh, are going to find a way to either make money or exploit or take advantage of uh, things that they find out there. So my job is to, is to figure out how to do that in a way that's consistent with the protection of the resource, the sustainability of the resource, but yet the uh, ability for people to do the things that they need to do uh, so that we can go into stores and shop and do what we need to do. Uh, I like the fact that David mentioned that every state is a coastal state. You know, years ago I was uh, asked to give a talk to a uh, Chamber of Commerce group in Colorado. And the title of my talk was Colorado is a Coastal State. And, and to back up that assertion, I had a, uh, a friend of mine who's a cartographer do a map of the world, but I had him reverse everything so that the oceans were land and the land were oceans or water. And, and I, said, I said, so this is the world I run around in. I said, so my land is wet. And, and, I, and, and what I want to do this morning is kind of bring you into my, my wet world and, and look at the world from a wet perspective. Many of you already do that, uh, but that's, it, the world looks very different when you're standing out in the ocean looking inland or standing out in the ocean looking around yourself because it becomes a much more, much more dynamic place, much more interesting place, and a lot less clearly defined in terms of its boundaries and how you might do things. You can't just, you can't just draw a state boundary or a coastal boundary and say, okay, my, my responsibility stops here. So, as, just as a side, the idea behind that Colorado as a coastal thing, state thing was to say, you know, if you think of the ocean as land and you think of the land as ocean, then you're just a ship right away from the shore. And, and all of that stuff that's moving around on the land just has to find its way to you in the middle of your ocean. So I think of the world in that reverse way, you know, because that's the world in which I live. And I run around uh, in this wet world, not water world, which was uh, not such a great movie, but, um, <laughs> but the wet world. <laughs> anyway, so, so I want to talk about a wet region, a world, a region of the world is becoming more wet, uh, a new ocean is opening up, because I think it's illustrative of some of the concerns that we have in the rest of the world. And, and I say that because we have an opportunity in this new ocean of the world to, to do things a little bit differently and to really think about how to inform what we're doing uh, around the rest of the world as we look at, as we look at the, the stresses that are placed upon the ocean today. So I spent a lot of time this past year thinking about the Arctic. Uh, primarily because I have had to think about the Arctic. You know, this, the Arctic used to be a place that we could go to, to explore, to, to do research, uh, but it's now becoming a place you have to go to because humans are moving in. I, I tell people it's like the world just opened up a new subdivision and everyone's moving in to figure out what they can, what they can do with it. And, uh, and some people are finding all sorts of interesting things to do up there. They're, they're drilling for oil and gas. There's a huge extractive resource potential up there in oil and gas and minerals. Uh, fisheries are, are tending to move into, you heard Senator Whitehouse say that uh, fish start looking for colder areas. Well, some of those colder areas are opening up in a way that allow the fish to move into them. So what we, we don't know what's going to happen as, as fish stocks move, but, but fish are sort of annoying in that they pay no attention to national boundaries. They just kind of find their way into wherever they need to go. And you have to figure out how do you now deal with the people who are going to follow them, because humans being who they are are going to follow resources. Uh, the Ice in the Arctic has been melting at a, at a very rapid rate. Now, I'm not a cli I'll, I'll assert right up front that I'm not an oceanographer nor am I a climate scientist, but I can tell you that there's water where there used to be ice. And that makes it very interesting from the standpoint of the United States Coast Guard because our job, as I mentioned, is to help the United States govern its maritime waters. And there are a lot of maritime waters um, in the Arctic. The Arctic is uh, probably in some respects the most geopolitically interesting place in the world because it's so geostrategically important. And it's geostrategically important because of all those economic resources and all of the people that surround it. So if you look at the world from the top, and, and if you haven't done that recently and you've got a globe at home, just flip it around, you'll see a very different picture of the world. And all of those countries that look so far away are suddenly much closer. And, and you can start to think about, in, in some ways to me, it's, it's, it's a larger version of the, the Great Lakes phenomenon, where, you know, if I look at Lake Erie, where I grew up, it's about, I don't know, maybe 40 miles across at its widest point, you know, a couple hundred miles long. I can't pretend that what happens on the Canadian side has no effect upon the, the U.S. side. So, so we work very closely with Canada to, to manage the health of the Great Lakes. One can argue how effective we've been over the years, but, but, but they're better off than they used to be. But we work very closely with them to manage that health 
because we know that whatever happens in the Great Lakes affects everybody in the Great Lakes. It affects all of those states and the provinces that surround the Great Lakes and all those cities and all those individuals. Well, the Arctic is much the same way. So if you think about the Arctic opening up and, and, and you look at the potential for it to be a new trade route, uh, it, could, it cuts a significant amount of time off the Europe to Asia trip, for example. If that becomes a predictable trade route, if, uh, if ecotourism and venture tourism uh, keeps spinning up the way we think it might, and if you begin to have lots of oil and gas drilling up in the Arctic, then it really doesn't matter where it happens up there. It's something that we need to care about. I I've long felt that the United States looks at itself as a nation with an Arctic state, named Alaska, but not as an Arctic nation. And, and I think that what we learned last summer when Shell Oil went up to begin drilling off the uh, northwest coast of Alaska, that we're actually an Arctic nation with a lot of equities with respect to how we develop that. And, and this is not a statement as, as to whether we should or shouldn't be developing it. That's for people like Senator Whitehouse and others to determine. Uh, it's my job to figure out if we do decide to develop that, how do we do it in a way that doesn't, that doesn't dramatically affect the quality of life for not just the people who live in that region, the, the native Alaskans, the other indigenous tribes, as well as those of us who move up there to, to work in those oil fields, to work in those, uh, those uh, uh, businesses. But how does it affect us? You know, how does it affect the nation? So I would argue very strongly that if you, if, you, if you care about the health and the stewardship of the oceans, you need to really care about what's happening in a brand new ocean. Because if you can get it right in a brand new ocean, you can begin to move those kinds of policies and, and, and activities down into the way we treat the rest of this world. And I think it can inform very closely. So to that end, so what have we been doing? I, I mentioned I spent a lot of time thinking about the Arctic. I've also spent a lot of time in the Arctic this last year, uh, which for somebody who spent a fair amount of his career uh, in the South Pacific and Gulf Coast <laughs> and south of I-10 uh, and closer to the equator, it's, um, it's a pretty cold place. Uh, so it's not ice-free yet, although it's, it's coming close in the summer months. But I was uh, just recently, uh, I headed a U.S. delegation to the Russian Arctic. It was sponsored by the Russian Security Council for Arctic Council members in advance of the uh, Arctic Council ministerial that's happening this week in uh, Sweden. And uh, the purpose of it really, I think, was for Russia to show us the world and work that they're developing. So Russia sees the Arctic. The Arctic is like the Gulf Coast of the United States to Russia. 30% of the Russian land mass is above the Arctic Circle. About 20% of their gross domestic product comes from Arctic activities, uh, and they are developing that. They're developing the Northern Sea Route, which is the which is the route along the top of uh, the Russian Arctic coast, which would which would ultimately be positioned as a new trade route between Europe and Asia. Again, it has to be predictable, and it's a long way maybe from being fully developed. But 46 vessels transited that route last year. That's 46 more than transited the route the previous year. So that's. That's a big sign. And at a minimum, vessels carrying oil and gas from Russian oil and gas development are going to be moving across there. So, so these, these are realities. These are not things that we can do, that we can change. We have, we have to be able to respond to them. We have to act with them accordingly. So part of our work has been, to, has been to look at the Arctic very carefully and think about what does it mean to have to operate up there? What does it mean to have to, to, have to manage in this very fragile environment, in a place where we don't really know what would happen if you had a major oil spill up there? And not necessarily even a major oil spill from, a, from a, a blowout of a well. What happens if you have a ship collision up there and you spill uh, ship oil? In some respects, that's a lot worse than crude oil coming out of the ground because it's been refined and it's got, it's got properties that don't make it as biodegradable as, um, as something coming directly out of the ground would be. And we don't really have a lot of great information about how you clean up oil in Arctic sea ice. So, so those are things that are of great concern to us. We worked very carefully over the last couple, or closely over the last couple of years, with our Arctic Council uh, counterparts. Those are the eight. Uh, well, it's the five Arctic states that border the Arctic directly, and the three additional states, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland, that don't necessarily that don't border directly, but are part of the Arctic Council. And we developed the search and rescue. Um, agreement as well as an oil spill uh, response agreement. But I will tell you that there are agreements only. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to, to actually figure out how you implement those agreements. And to that end, uh, I think many of you may have seen that the President last week signed uh, a United States Arctic strategy and put it out on Friday of last week, so it's on the White House website. I would encourage you to read it. It's a, it's a relatively straightforward uh, document. We, in turn, in the Coast Guard have, have 
finished our Arctic strategy. We'll be publishing it next week, uh, so the Commandant will be rolling that out. And, that, and what our strategy looks to is, all right, given that we've now identified the Arctic as a region of, of national concern, as a region of environmental sensitivity, uh, a region of concern for indigenous populations, and a region of concern with respect to the change that we're, that's occurring in the climate. So we don't know what that's going to mean to us. Um, what's the Coast Guard going to do about it? So we're going to have our Arctic strategy out next week, and I, I would uh, encourage you to read it. It essentially looks at three things. It says, we've got to figure out how to improve our awareness of what's happening up there. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to work more closely with uh, the various people up there, so I said broadening partnerships, but that's a, just a shorthand for saying we need to understand all the players up there. And then, uh, and then we need to do something about modernizing our governance regimes. So let me finish by just talking a little bit about what I mean by this governance. And it goes back to this idea that you've got to operate right now. You know, so, so, the, so I live in this very non-abstract world where, where there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on, not to figure out how to deal with it. There's, there's oil spills every day, there's, there's potential for oil spills every day, there's a lot of vessel traffic. I, that's not going to go away. It's probably only going to get more intense. So we have to do that in a smart and sustainable way. Uh, to that end, uh, you look in the Arctic, and what's interesting is there are a lot of regimes for how we manage oceans. Uh, some are written into law, and some are just written into policy, and some are just agreements we have with with other nations and, and the uh, folks who use the water. And, those, and, some, and they start with things like territorial seas, so up to 12 miles, exclusive economic zones, up to 200 miles, the kinds of things you can do within there that's legal and stuff that you shouldn't be doing, uh, things that are prohibited, you know, illegal fishing, drift net fishing, um, and indiscriminate uh, bycatch and so forth. So there's all those, all those kinds of regimes in place. And then there are, are uh, determinations as to how you manage the movement of traffic uh, in places, what kind of licenses that you have to have, how the ships have to be constructed, and so forth. But when you get up into a new ocean, a place that you, as I said, you used to be able to go to uh, if you wanted to, but you didn't have to, but now, now we've built a subdivision and somebody's got to move in and put in the streets and the stoplights and the traffic schemes and all the other business, we you realize that there's, there's a lot of stuff that actually hasn't been answered up there. Like, Who's responsible for oil if it spills on one side and moves over the other side? How's that going to be dealt with? Who's responsible for managing the traffic flows through this very narrow area called the Bering Strait? And how are you going to do that? What happens when the fish that are on our side of the maritime boundary line between us and Russia move to the Russian side of the maritime boundary line and we still claim those as our fish? What about the uh, border, the water border, maritime border between the United States and Canada, which it turns out has actually never been Defined, and, uh, and be, but I mean, get, we get along really well with the Canadians, um, except for that little dust up back in 1812. But um, <laughs> we get along pretty well with them. But it's we get along with them well because we haven't had to dispute it, and we generally look the other way when we have to deal with this lack of boundary. But if, for example, the Northwest Passage, which is a passage on the other side of the Arctic that runs across the top of the North American continent, if that opens up. And suddenly that boundary becomes more important because now you have things like tariffs and, and pilotage rules and all sorts of other just day-to-day -day practical things that come into play that have to be dealt with. So I would assert that, that the governance of the, of the Arctic region is probably one of the most important, and the governance includes all of this protection of the region, is one of the most important uh, overarching categories of, of concern that we should have. And so I applaud the work of groups like uh, Blue Vision and all of you who, who support this and many of you who have your own uh, independent organizations because that informs that and I would encourage you to inform people like the members of Congress, people like me, and, um, and keep the dialogue going because it helps those of us, particularly those of us in the Coast Guard who, are, who have to deal day to day with implementing regulations, enforcing those regulations, and determining whether those regulations are adequate, uh, make sure we're doing it right. You don't get the governance regimes right. You can't translate those to the rest of the world. So I, I really think that we have an opportunity in the Arctic to do some things there that can then actually back inform all the ways in which we deal with, with other ocean issues. And we can do it in a, in a way because it's so immediate and imperative to the nations that are up there. I will tell you that, that whether you're looking at a nation that's dramatically developing its Arctic coast like Russia or other nations that are very concerned about that development, uh, it gives you an immediate way to talk about it because it, it's right in your face. So I like 
having something right in our face because it forces you to deal with it, I hope. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's my, my, my private citizen's hope for what's happening in the Arctic, and I can tell you that the, the goal of the Coast Guard is to try to keep that in the forefront. And to that end, we're doing a lot of educating on Arctic issues because we think the Arctic issue is actually educating on the ocean issues around the world. So with that, I'll just um, end and say thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm really looking, as you see, I don't have a lot to show you uh, because I heard that Erica has got uh, a great movie she's going to show you. So that'll be far more entertaining, but, um, but I, uh, I thank you for your interest and, uh, and I thank you for keeping people like me aware of the issues because uh, if I don't know what the issues are, it's very hard to figure out how to address the day-to-day -day operations. And, um, and I'm not afraid of criticism, nor, and, and nor should we be. I, you know, any honest, open, you know, critical look at the way we do business is, is important. So the policies and the politics are, are critical for informing it and for getting it right. The exploration and discovery feeds back into that, but it's the day-to-day -day operations that, uh, where it all comes home. And if you don't get that right, then you got some real problems. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to stick around for any questions. You have.